Greeting from Paris. I'm Dr. Elie Azoulay from the St. Louis Hospital, and uh, I'm the coordinator of the FAMIRA study group, uh, a group that uh, focuses on communication and uh, family members in the ICU. Today, I'm going to present you with uh, how it is to survive COVID for patients, for family members, as well as for us, the healthcare providers. I have no disclosure. I just need to remind that we are in a situation where quarantine has been imposed to all uh, the, the, the people in our countries as to deal with the pandemic. This quarantine on its own, without any infection, without any hospitalization, without the ICU, is one of the major reasons why people outside the hospital may present with stress, uh, post-traumatic stress disorders, with anger, with frustration, as well as with many communication gaps because of the infodemics, uh, as you know, the televisions and all the media systems has provided an overwhelming amount of information so uh, we were lost uh, in uh, the COVID experience. Um, we are dealing with patients who basically have, have something that is different, but mostly mimic uh, an acute respiratory distress syndrome. So we are going back to the papers published by Mark Herridge in Toronto and her group, uh, the wonderful paper published in 2003, following very thoroughly and very qualitatively RDS survivors, showing that uh, at the short time, they may have uh, many different uh, uh, outcome issues. Uh, but when we are looking very carefully at one year after, we can see that we have fatigue, uh, muscle weakness. Uh, we may have some physiological disturbances. Um, and SF36, uh, takes a very long time to come back. Uh, and we know that even if it's better that three months after ICU discharge, we are very far from the normal. And the six minute walking test was also much better than at three months, but still very different than the normal. Again, when we are looking two years after RDS on another outcome that is here, depression and depressive symptoms, uh, we can see that these are very much steady over time and we are having patients two years after ICU discharge will remain very frail. And when we are looking long term after ICU discharge, five years, it is even better, but we are still very far from the normal physically, psychologically and cognitively. When we are looking at family members, so of course for patients, we will have data after COVID-19, but as we are not even six months after the pandemic, these data are now being collected and we will have them soon available. For family members, we know that they are with RDS at increase of post-ICU syndrome, post-ICU burden, including anxiety, depression, PTSD, but also isolation, and we know that these family members are very frail. What is interesting is that after RDS, family members are even more frail than the patient themselves. They have a risk of psychological distress. We know that they can be even sicker than the patients cognitively. They have, when there's a loss, a severe complicated grief. We know that, of course, these family members have had the lockdown they also may have not the opportunity to come to the ICU because of limitation in the ability, in the availability of PPEs. Um, visitation policies have been disturbed. Uh, and we know that also hospitals were very reluctant uh, to share uh, PPE. The family many members sometimes didn't want to come to bother and see the patient. There is again the infodemic. Uh, and we know that ourselves were very stressed uh, so that we were not able to provide family members with the best communication options. This is baseline outside COVID. And you can see that family members, one year after a, a patient discharge, are still with a very high level of depression. And these depression symptoms, they decrease over time, but not in everyone, making that uh, often family members, even one year after ICU discharge, might be with severe depressive symptoms. We know that they are at one year at 43%, which is 
very high as compared to the general population. And we know that uh, when we are with family members of younger age, when the patient care effect on other activities with less social support, less sense on control over life, uh, when there is less personal growth. Uh, but as you can see, there are not patient variables. These are variables related to family members. RDS and critical care illness generate per se a disease for family members that is almost independent of the patient, but certainly dependent on who are the family members before ICU admission. This is a very interesting study in the sickest patients, uh, and those who are receiving ECMO for uh, re refractory hypoxemia. And you can see that when we are looking at family members after uh, uh, ICU discharge in family members of survivors, they have more PTSD and depression than the patient themselves, showing very clearly that family members are very, very frail and vulnerable. Unfortunately, when the patients are dying in the ICU, we know that the fact that family members could re report that patients were not e able to breathe peacefully was associated with an increased rate uh, of PTSD. And this is a very important element to keep in mind uh, because we know that these family members will be very vulnerable. We have developed these 5S strategy for family members of COVID-19 patients. We simulated the visits with no limits, uh, despite uh, the regulations. Uh, we had a standardized or written information for the family members. Um, we set up routine telephone calls with the family. Family members um, was asked to be creative, to use video, to use uh, cell phones, uh, as to be in contact with the patients and the team diaries, text messages, major groups, uh, so that the link was maintained between the family and the ICU. And of course, uh, when we were in uh, close to the end of life, we started another model based with no limit, uh, as the family members could be able to say goodbye to the patient. Ourselves, the healthcare providers, we are in a situation where we were not expecting such a surge so that we were very much in a situation of uh, being overwhelmed by the amount <clears throat> of work, uh, but also by the qualitative fact that we were dealing with uh, an epidemic that we were not knowing. We didn't know what were the specific treatments uh, and we had to learn by doing. And uh, we know that we had to learn how to triage, even if we applied the same regulation than for the flu, for example, how to make decisions. And we made our best um, out of the very big time of surge to do like for everyone. But still, there was uh, such a stress uh, that we were significantly affected. Um, and I would say that one of the main points is that we were also with the fear of getting infected and of transmitting the infection to our family members. This is a very interesting paper outside uh, the ICU, published in Brain, Behavior and Immunity, where this is a systematic review of 13 studies showing that outside the ICU, the pooled prevalence of anxiety for healthcare providers was uh, above 20%, as was depression, um, and insomnia was very close to 40%. And this was outside the ICU. And there are now two studies, cross-sectional surveys, that have addressed uh, these mental uh, health symptoms, uh, mental health outcomes um, in uh, uh, healthcare providers in the ICU. The first paper comes from China and was published as early as March. Um, and uh, we know that depression, anxiety, and insomnia were reported by a very high proportion of healthcare providers. Depression affected 50% of the nurses and physicians, anxiety 44%, and insomnia 34%. And we know that these symptoms were very much high in China, but they were high in every country that has measured and reported these symptoms. In France, for example, in this paper, uh, just accepted in the Blue Journal, published uh, in uh, the uh, that will be published in uh, the next days. Um, the study was called Burden Cove, and the cross-sectional study was performed in 21 ICUs in France at the time of the surge, so in an acute phase. 
we had more than 1,000 respondents. And again, you can see that symptoms of anxiety affected 50% of the healthcare providers, depression 30%, and peritraumatic dissociation that is measured with the PDEQ, a questionnaire dedicated to uh, dissociation is a very highly a very highly associated with PTSD, but it is measured in an acute phase, affected 32%. And we can see that the nursing staff uh, was the first to be affected uh, by anxiety and depression, but also the medical student as well as the nurses were affected by peritraumatic dissociation. The important thing in this study is that there were six modifiable determinants of symptoms of mental health disorders. One was the fear of being infected. That was a major determinant of all the symptoms. The inability to rest. So we need to understand how we can organize the ICU work so that everyone can have a period of rest. Inability to care for the family. Struggling with difficult personal emotions regrets about how the visitation policies were restricted for family members, as well as when end-of-life decisions were believed to be suboptimal. Interestingly, the fear of infection has been reported by other groups, and you can see here that this is part of a, a major, it is central in the way it can provide depression, anxiety, and stress, as well as intolerance uh, of uh, uncertainty, which is, as you know, in a pandemic with a newly described disease, uncertainty is always present. And this is another paper outside the ICU reporting that more than 90% of the healthcare providers expressed this fear of being infected, and this was very much associated with burnout. Interestingly, when we are looking at all the symptoms and all the syndromes that are described, uh, we can see that uh, burnout was one of those, but post-traumatic stress disorders, anxiety and depression were also reported. We all know burnout. We know the symptoms of vulnerability, of helplessness, of hopeless that we can report when we have burnout. And we know that many feelings can be uh, reported in a, a burnout environment. And we, as a, a critical care uh, healthcare providers, we need to understand whether one of our colleagues or ourselves could have burnout because this is an emergency, not only to screen, to detect, and also to treat. In this paper that we performed with uh, the European Society of Intensive Care Medicine uh, and a group of steering committee dedicated for that, uh, you can see that not only the prevalence of burnout uh, and anxiety was very much different across regions and across country, across countries, but also the prevalence was were very high with about half the cases, uh, half the people reporting uh, uh, burnout, anxiety, and less than 30% reported depression, showing that these mental health outcomes are very prevalent uh, in healthcare providers. In this study, we had also about 1,000 answers, making that it is a significant uh, proportion of, uh, of people who presented with mental health outcomes. There's a call of action. This call for action concerns ICU professionals, the leaders, the nurse managers, the hospital administrators, funding agencies, as well as every professional society. We need to act as to reduce the prevalence of burnout, anxiety, and depression, usually on a, ba a normal basis, but also in a time of surge. And I must say that there are many actions that we could implement as to be able to improve uh, the healthcare environment uh, and to improve the experience of intensive care for everyone. This is based on communication, cohesion, how we can promote well-being on a regular basis, as well as psychological support. If I want to summarize, I would say that overall, outside the COVID-19, acute respiratory failure and RDS are putting family members with a very high risk of emotional burden. Of course, inside the COVID-19, with isolation, containment, lockdown, it is worsening all the symptoms uh, and also, of course, the global population as well as uh, caregivers. Um, we need to implement a call of action urgently as to avoid having uh, 
uh, contamination and uh, uh, development of these symptoms and to improve the ICU experience for everyone. Thank you very much for your attention.